Okay, uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm not seeing everybody. I suppose everybody is <laughs> well set, so I can start now. Today is our last class, and I'm going to talk about a, a very a comprehensive subject. I'm going to talk about energy planning and uh, investments in Brazil, commercialization and investments in Brazil. Okay. Uh, I don't know how much time I'm going to spend to cover this subject, but uh, like last week, if you have, if I'm going too fast, please interrupt me and ask questions. Okay. So let's see. Uh, first of all, uh, what is energy planning? Because I'm going back one slide. The the title uh, uh, is focused on two things: energy planning and uh, investments. Okay, so it's a very wide subject, and the problem is that uh, uh, the definitions are not consensual. Okay, somebody may be thinking one thing and uh, referring to energy planning, and some other people may think otherwise. So let's try first to discuss a little bit these ideas related to energy planning. Okay, so what is energy planning? Now, that you well you followed all all the preceding classes you you have a, a certain amount of knowledge that uh, i'm going to try to to bundle together okay today so what is energy planning depending on the perspective uh, depending on the perspective you may uh, have different meanings for this question what is energy planning okay so um I recommend. I really like this uh, this uh, this guy Daniel Jurgen, and his two I consider seminal books, uh, and I really suggest you read these books because it's it's very very uh, instructive. Okay, the first one, the prize, describes uh, the enemy. Okay, um, the oil industry actually from starting from from the end of the 1800s, okay? So it's very important to have a, a knowledge about this subject, uh, especially coal, uh, sorry, oil. And this uh, last book, I think it's from 2011, it's a very, very interesting. It talks about uh, uh, all kinds of energies, wind energy, even, even our... Um, it, he describes even our projects here in Brazil related to second generation ethanol. Okay, so it's very comprehensive, this book. Uh, and he talks not only about technologies, but also about uh, regulation and general ideas and so on. So it's a very, very interesting book to read, to have uh, a very good idea of the scenario, because each one of us is... is um, doing some research, I'm sure, on specific topics compared to this very wide view of the area, especially of the renewable energies area. Okay, so uh, when he talks about energy planning, uh, he's mostly talking about strategies for the development of global energy systems. These energy systems may be local, regional or national. Okay, so energy planning is something like this. Uh, and given that uh, the definition can, can be very, very wide, actually, uh, I decided to, to uh, approach this subject in this class through some case studies. And the idea is, uh, instead of trying to, to build up a very sophisticated and elaborated definition, I'm just going to talk about uh, real cases, actual cases, okay, uh, in which energy planning and uh, the financial part of energy was involved, okay. So today I'm going to talk about three cases. Uh, those are three cases that uh, uh, I, partic I participated somehow, okay. I had some. Uh, well, some uh, good level of involvement in these cases, okay? So the first one was a plan for fostering social and economical developments in the state of Piauí here in Brazil, okay? And I was responsible 
for the energy investments portfolio. Okay, this project was uh, hired by the state government of Piauí, and uh, well, we had this portfolio related to energy, which I was responsible for. But also, uh, the, the the interesting part of this project was that uh, it was also very comprehensive because uh, it had a, a tourism investments portfolio, for instance, and what's the relation between tourism and uh, energy generation, especially energy uh, wind generation in Piauí, okay, because it, uh, its coast is very, very narrow, very limited, uh, something about 70 kilometers of, of sea, of coast, okay, so um, it competes, uh, investments or uh, wind energy projects competes with uh, with tourism investments. Okay, so the opportunity cost is high in this in this place uh, related to this project. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how can you use um, these projects to foster social development in a state that uh, still have problems. Okay, uh, the second case is more related to, to industrial processes. Okay, the first one is related to a government. If, if some of you guys in the future uh, start working with a government, a state government or a federal government, for instance, so you're going to experience things uh, very similar to these things that I'm going to talk about in this first case. Okay, the second case is more related to industrial processing so some of you may may work in the future uh, in some industries, especially sugarcane industry. So I'm going to talk about uh, um, multi-objective optimization of the integrated 1G, 2G sugarcane mill, okay, with a production of supercritical CO2. Okay, so I, I already described, we already saw this in terms of uh, exergy balance, for instance, but today I'm going to describe how, uh, how do you do to operate this, uh, this unit, this industrial unit, in order to uh, optimize its performance. Okay? The, the third case is more related to, it's still op optimization, okay? Uh, so it's optimization and rationalization. I want to state the difference between optimization and rationalization okay, at the production of, and distribution of water in São Carlos. So it was um, a study hired by the municipal government here in São Carlos and the problem was that um, the energy bill was too high. Okay, was too high so they wanted to do something in order to um, something to reduce the amount of money spent in with energy related to the especially distribution of water th uh, throughout the city. Okay, so I'm going to talk about these three cases and well, I'm trying to emphasize the points related to energy planning and uh, investments. Okay, especially in the first, the first uh, case study is very closely related to investments. Okay, uh, and what all these three cases have in common, uh, these energy planning strategies may involve, as I mentioned in the first, for the first case, fostering and sustainability. Okay, you imagine, you can imagine you are uh, on the shoes of the governor, for, for instance. Okay, uh, so you're very concerned in fostering, you want to foster development, especially in a state that is not as uh, developed as the the most developed ones, okay, but you also have concerns about sustainability, okay. So um, I wrote some phrases here, and this is related to I think I already talked about this. Everybody agrees with investments in energy, but not in my backyard, okay. So they they don't want uh, a windmill. They want the, they don't want to see a windmill. Uh, somehow, okay, so they are in favor, yes, but not in my backyard. Energy optimization, uh, 
well, suffers from a problem, I would say, uh, related to this phrase, no red ribbons to cut. Okay, so when you think about optimization, optimization means that you're going to fine tune your industrial processes, for instance. So it, it may be very, uh, very significant uh, what you can gain from optimization, but be aware that uh, you're not doing something new. Okay, that means that there are no red ribbons to cut. You're simply doing better. Okay, you're, you're not building a new uh, power plant or something like this. You're simply operating uh, this power plant, for instance, but you're operating uh, with a, a more um, elevated level of uh, knowledge of the processes. So you, you're able to fine tune the process okay so the problem that no red ribbons to cut this uh, hampers uh, the investment that you could obtain in optimization okay so, but the gains are very 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 significant this is uh, really important okay and the last one energy rationalization means uh, does does not mean necessary to reduce the amount of energy spent, okay, but it surely involves making it cheaper, uh, making it cheaper, uh, or in other words, spending less money, okay, for the same amount of energy. Okay, so these two things are, are can be done uh, simultaneously, okay, optimization and rationalization, and well, they all relate to this uh, these points here, okay. Uh, another phrase by Daniel Jürgen, which um, I think, uh, I think uh, summarizes the ideas behind these this bullets here, okay, is that the evolution of energy systems is slow, okay, because it involves uh, the evolution of markets. I'm going to show you today some things about our market here in Brazil, okay. It involves also development of technologies, new technologies, or um, adaptation of uh, already mature technologies to specific problems, which is exactly the, the case of second generation ethanol, okay? But also very important things such as regulation, okay? I'm gonna talk about regulation in uh, our first case study, okay? So this evolution is uh, slow because it involves several, several areas that have to be harmonized, okay? Uh, well, it is low and also subjected to objective as well as subjective aspects. Uh, as I mentioned, yes, but not in my backyard. This is subjective perception because everybody wants renewable energies. But if you have to have uh, a windmill in your backyard, so to say, uh, would you be uh, still in favor? Okay, so it's a subjective promise. I already said I would love to have a windmill uh, in my in my backyard because I really I really love windmills. Okay, but you know I'm an I'm an engineer. As an engineer, it's supposed I'm supposed to like these things. Okay, but it's subjective. Okay, so uh, I think it, this phrase is very interesting because it summarizes all the ideas that I want to pass to you today. Okay, so let's see. How can we do this, okay? Uh, another point is that um, energy planning involves also three very important questions, okay? The first one is related to growth of supply to meet demands. This is more related, or, or at least I want to focus on uh, social development, okay? So demands from social developments, okay? And the question related to this is, uh, will there be enough energy to sustain the quality of life for everybody? Okay. Uh, again, if I'm uh, the government of some state like Piauí, I want to produce, I want to foster, I want to, to obtain social development, and I know that this, is, this will increase demand for energy. Okay. People are going to spend uh, or have access to illumination, for instance. Illumination needs energy. And so uh, I may be concerned if uh, there will be enough energy to sustain 
to, to meet this demand. Okay? Another point uh, is related to energy security okay? and the susceptibility of our systems. Okay? As we say here in Brazil, the, the, the blackouts, the word in Portuguese is apagão. Okay? Uh, you see, we had some blackouts in the past, some apagões in the past, and uh, this is to caused by uh, intrinsic susceptibility of our special electricity systems. We also had some problems related to fuel distribution. Okay, in the 70s, I don't know if you, <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but uh, you may be, you may have read about it. Uh, the problem related to ethanol, ethanol supply. Okay, uh, we had some problems, uh, roughly. And I would say 95% of all our uh, cars, small cars, were run with ethanol. Okay, so it was very widespread the use of ethanol, but um, well, somehow we had problem uh, obtaining this ethanol. So uh, this share, 95%, dropped uh, dramatically. I would say. Okay, it's only now with flex fuel cars that. Uh, Ethanol as a fuel for uh, cars uh, started to, to be used more intensively. Okay, so the, I want to talk about a little bit about this susceptibility of our energy systems. And uh, also problems related to climate changes. That was the subject of our first class. Okay, uh, the intensive and increasing consumption of energy will, will this trigger climate changes that threaten our existence? Okay, this is uh, a more diffuse concern, I would say, because there are other things that threaten our existence, but uh, climate change sure is surely one. Okay, we know this happened in the past before. You know, when I say in the past in a geological scale, okay, we had, I mean, uh, Earth had uh, six mass extinction events, okay, and we may be triggering uh, one event like this, okay, or relate uh, of mass extinction. Okay, so those questions are uh, behind the subjects that I'm going to focus today. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the first one, the first question related to growth of supply to meet demands. And as I said, uh, I'm going to talk about this through this case study which was a plan for fostering social and economical developments in Piauí. state of Piauí in Brazil uh, is one of the poorest states in Brazil. Okay, uh, very, very interesting potential you, you will see, um, especially in the energy area. Okay, and uh, just to to be sure, okay, uh, I was responsible for, for this energy investment portfolio. Okay, so I'm going to describe this process. Uh, so uh, you, you must put yourselves in the shoes of the governor. Okay, you want to foster development, social development for, for your people. Okay, uh, so when you think about development, you think about quality of life. Okay, quality. You want a better quality of life for the people in the state of Piauí. Uh, to put this in more objective terms, okay, objective. The, the key word here is objective. Okay, uh, you can think in, in terms of three aspects. Okay, uh, well, they are going to appear here. Okay, so the first three aspects related to quality of life. Okay. You may think about health, which is related to longevity. Okay, how many years are you going to live? Okay, in average. So the first aspect of quality of life is health, longevity. Okay, the other aspect of life is related to knowledge uh, slash awareness. Why do I put awareness here? Okay, because uh, I mean knowledge, not only in the like um, in mathematics. You are very good in mathematics. This is fine. This is great, but awareness is something more. Okay, 
how does uh, what's the relation between uh, I don't know polynomial division and uh, quality of life okay and uh, the electricity bill that I get every month in my house okay so this is related to knowledge instruction and so on citizenship this is related also to citizenship okay knowing the laws and uh, the rights and obligation as a citizen okay so this is more related to awareness okay another point is uh, the standard of living okay if I have access to medications for instance okay this is very important uh, so those are the aspects I have to put this in numbers so I'm going I'm going to look for indicators these indicators okay relate to this aspect for instance uh, life expectancy at birth okay this is objective this can be measured uh, this one uh, relate to knowledge slash awareness uh, the expected years of schooling how many years in school are you going to spend or, or an average citizen is going to spend and uh, this um, third indicator okay related to standard of living uh, what what can I buy for instance uh, with the money I get um, okay so this is related to the national income per capita okay so it's a measure of um, the gross national production okay and uh, how much each one gets okay and now I have numbers as I said th those indicators are objective I can make the calculations so here are the definitions that we're going to use okay so uh, the letter I here in the end of this indexes uh, refers to index okay so life expectancy index okay so it's calculated like this you see it's very objective life expectant expectancy at birth okay minus 20 actually normalized okay minus 20 divided by 85 minus 20 okay so 85 because it's a, a very good target 85 years of course okay the um, schooling index okay uh, oh well the legend is here okay so mysi is mean years of schooling okay minus expected years of schooling okay so divided by two and the the third one is uh, related to the gross national income pieces per capita okay and 75,000 here the normalizing number okay is uh, is is uh, yeah is um, uh, well a, a target okay and this formula actually normalizes between zero and one zero if your income per capita is one hundred dollars that's a tragedy actually okay and seventy five thousand dollars per capita it's a very good average number okay just for you to have an idea brazil the national income here in brazil per capita is uh fifteen thousand one hundred forty dollars per capita okay so our index is 0.76 Okay, so with the, these three three indicators, what you're going to do now is average them out, and we're going to use for this uh, a, a harmonic average. Okay, so it's uh, you multiply them all and um, the take the root. Okay, so this average called harmonic average, sorry, geometric average, geometric average. Uh, yeah, you could do, uh, since they are normalized, you could do um, other types of, of uh, arithmetic average, for instance. You could do this. But this one is, um, I think, more suitable for what you want because the geometric average actually uh, penalizes when these numbers are very different from each other. Okay? It's very simple. If you have... Uh, if you have one one and zero okay the human development index is zero because 10 times uh, sorry one times one times zero is zero okay and if it's a um, 
arithmetic average. 1 plus 1 plus 0, it's 2 divided by 3, okay, 0 0.66. Okay, so uh, you see when the grades here are very different, this tends to go down, okay. So the idea is to have a kind of a, an equilibrium between these uh, aspects, okay. So you get this definition, which uh, I, I'm sure you know, okay, Human Development Index. And so it's a very objective way of assessing quality of life. All countries uh, have data on this, so it's uh, another advantage of using this number is that you can compare different countries, okay. Um, it has some uh, limitations, okay, it has some limitations. Uh, and th there are some other indicators uh, which try to cope with this limitation. But this one is very, very, very widespread, so it's very uh, a very good number, especially when you compare different nations. Okay, so let's move on. So we now have a very objective indicator of quality of life. The question is, what is the relation between human development index and energy, okay, because HDI assesses quality of life. So I'm asking what's the relation between quality of life and energy, especially energy used by people, okay. So again, you can um, get data from, from many countries around the world. So here you have the Human Development Index and the, the energy used per capita in kilowatts, actually power per capita, okay? You can, you can uh, uh, put this, these numbers both in terms of energy and power, okay? You, the, the result is the same. Okay, so you see very clearly that uh, the less development, the, the less developed countries, Congo, Niger, uh, and so on, uh, Serra, uh, Serra Leoa, the, the worst one, okay, so they have a very uh, small use of energy per capita, okay, so this is very, the correlation is very strong here, okay, between uh, human development index and energy per capita, okay. You also have, uh, I would say, an intermediary bunch of, of countries, Brazil, included, which you have some social development and some use of energy, okay, and the, the highest quality countries, okay, a very high use of energy, okay. Well, um, um, the Emirates is not a very good example, well, it's a good example of when this correlation fails, because they are, um, they produce, they are the, the biggest oil producers in the world, okay? So the number here, and the population is uh, relatively small. So the number here is very high, okay? 14 kilowatts per capita. But this is not uh, reflecting uh, in quality of life. So, so this is related to the distribution of all the goods, of all the the profits and so on related to the production of this energy, okay? Uh, I would say France and uh, Germany and so on, you have them around here because they are not uh, very significant producers of, of energy. They produce the necessary for their consumption and they have a very high quality of life, okay? Uh, so this is obviously, obviously a a very strong relation to, I would say, five kilowatts per capita, okay, five, because uh, beyond this, you have a kind of a saturation of this curve. I mean, uh, an increase, increase in energy per capita does not necessarily reflect in quality of life. It, it will depend on uh, how, how the politics in this country and so on, okay. So um, I would say two good examples of this are the Emirates and Nor Norway, okay? Norway, because Norway is a democracy and so on, okay? 
So the mechanisms of distribution of wealth are, I would say, more improved in Norway when you compare to, to the Emirates, with the Emirates, okay? Uh, okay, so how can we use this, these statistics to, to make our planning, okay? So we see that there is a strong correlation between HDI and energy per capita, okay? And we can, we can fit a curve here, is this black curve here, okay? So this curve is a kind of an exponential curve, and uh, we can also uh, use, introduce, I would say, two parameters, small a and small b, okay, in order to cope with differences, uh, methodological differences, when different countries assess this number, okay? So you can even be as elaborated as this, okay? Okay, so we have this model. This, this is, will be a model. We're going to use this to try to assess how much energy PLE is going to demand in the future if you expect a certain type of development. That's how we're going to use it, okay? And another working formula is since we have the power per capita, CPT stands for cap per capita, okay? CP, it's still in Portuguese, sorry for this, okay? Uh, when you have to, when you want to calculate uh, the absolute quantity of power, you simply multiply this by the population. Okay, in PAWE, we're going to do this by by cities. Okay, so we're going to calculate the energy per capita for every city in PAWE because different uh, configurations and different uh, characteristics. If it's more related to, to agricultural activities, it will have a certain type of demand for energy. If it's more related to tourism, for instance, the, the demands will be different. So we're going to do this by cities. And if you want to calculate the total amount of power slash energy, okay, you simply multiply by the population of each city, then you add everything up. Okay, So that's another important working formula. So let's see how are we going to use this. Okay, how? Uh, what is this planning I'm talking about? So the idea is, is this. Okay, let's try to to have a graph. So here you have the total demand of energy in megawatts, and during time, and you start today. Okay, you start today. Um, these blue curves here represent actually uh, expected social developments or expected increase in demand related to different uh, aspects of social development. I'm going to elaborate on that in a few moments. Okay, I just want to talk about this um, this overall idea of energy planning. So you have, for instance, this first expected increase in demand, okay, related to vegetative growth plus, plus social development, according to the perspectives that I'm going to show you in a moment, okay? Uh, the other one, for instance, this other blue curve here, is the increase in demand related only with the population growth, okay? Population, you expect it to grow, so the demand will grow. Okay, so this is a very uh, baseline actually. And so if you have the uh, vegetative growth plus some kind of social development, okay, you expect to have uh, a more strong increase in demand. Okay, and the red curve is the energy supply. Okay, so these two curves are you may we're going to have more actually work as um, limiting okay, curves for you to plan your energy supply. So this red curve is your path, actually. So you're going to plan the investments to meet this demand. Okay, So the red curve actually stands for a supply. And this is plan. You may have okay, things like this. The, the best scenario is this one, is to work with uh, two 
social development scenarios and try to plan your demand to, to stay in between these two uh, limiting scenarios, okay? Uh, things may happen, okay, such as this one. You may have, uh, for instance, overinvestment, so the supply is going to, is above even your most optimistic scenario of, of social increase, okay? And what happens is that this will uh, actually tend to go down after a while, okay? Why is this? Because of price, okay? Supply and demand. So um, when you have this situation, this is okay, no problem. From the point of view of, of social development, no problem, this situation here, okay? But when you have this, when you have less supply, than your demand, if, the, if this is the actual demand, okay, uh, what happens is that this is not possible anymore, okay, because uh, somebody is needing, or uh, a whole bunch of people is needing uh, energy for illumination, they don't have that energy, so they don't have illumination, and this affects their quality of life, okay, so the scenario is no longer possible. So, Having overinvestment is not, uh, it's not a problem in the short term, but it may be a problem in the medium and long term, okay? So overinvestment is not th something that uh, it's interesting to have, okay? You may have, but you, you have to do something to avoid this, this problem, okay? Uh, and we had this in Brazil, in the in a few years ago, I I, I couldn't uh, find a translation. This is uh, uh, from one of our newspapers in Brazil, okay, from a, a new site. Uh, and this this happened. I'm going to come back to this. This is when the government, the federal government, uh, forced renegotiation of all energy contracts. So what happened? is that we had uh, this situation not caused by, as in the previous slide, by, by supply and demand problems, but because of, uh, I would say, bad regulation, uh, bad in the sense that uh, it's, it's not, it's a regulation that is, or a politics, that is not stimulating investors to in, continue investing in energy. Okay, I'm going to show you the actual numbers because, well, this is qualitative, okay, but I'm going to show you the actual number, the effect of this uh, mandate, okay, imposed by the federal government. I'm going to show you this problem. So, yeah, let's, let's move on. Uh, another thing that may happen, which happened uh, here in Brazil in the last uh, few years, is, well, uh, this scenario here is your baseline is the increase of demand related only to growth of population. Okay, but if you are under a recession, you may have um, uh, a, an increase uh, less intense than you expect, even your baseline, okay? And this is related to a recession, economic recession, and that is exactly what happened here in Brazil in the, fa in the last uh, few years, okay? So let's see, um, because I was talking about these blue curves here. Okay, so let's let's calculate these blue curves. So for this, we have two things. We have to have two things. The first one we already have is this model, okay, related to human development index and uh, total power, okay. Uh, the other thing is uh, we need to define what kind of social development we want, okay? So let's, let me explain this uh, graphs here, okay? So uh, here is the human development index. Uh, uh, it's the uh, histogram of human development indexes of all PAOE's cities, okay? So uh, this was in 1990, 2000, 2010. Okay, 
uh, so it varied between um, 0 0.1 and 0 0.8 in the 90s, okay? Uh, 10 years later, you see two things are happening here. I'm, I'm going to draw something, a line here, because it's uh, materialized. So you see that, uh, the, sorry, I'm a, a little bit perfectionist, so I can't have this kind of thing. So you see that 10 years later, two things happened, two things, okay? First, the average HDI increased a little bit, okay? But also the dispersion around the average, suppose that the average is here, okay? The average in 2000 is, sorry, is something around here, okay? Something around here. So you see, at least visually, I think you can uh, identify that the dispersion around the average decreased, okay? And 10, times la 10 years later, the, the, the average increased a little bit more and also the dispersion, okay? So uh, during these this, uh, years, we had, or at least in PAOE, okay, uh, the average HDI increased and uh, which means, okay, this means that uh, the average quality of life is enhancing, okay, is being enhanced both in, in terms of those three aspects, longevity, uh, knowledge, and uh, wealth, okay? So it's increasing in average. But what's decreasing is since the the, the histogram is becoming more concentrated around the, the average, this implies that uh, you have less inequalities. Okay, so this is perfect, this is fantastic, that's exactly what we want to obtain. Okay, uh, increase in the overall HDI, but also decrease of inequalities, okay, as a result. Okay, as a result. Okay, uh, so that's it. That's we're going to base our models, our, our uh, social development models in this uh, in this aspect. Okay, so we're going to work with uh, three different scenarios. Okay, actually there will be a, a fourth one, which is only uh, which is our baseline because it's the rate to increase of the men when there's only populational growth, okay? So the first scenario, okay, considers only increase in the uh, human develop average human development index, okay? So we have only one of those aspects, okay? The second scenario here considers uh, in both increase in average Okay, so the average is increasing, and also dispersion is decreasing, okay? But the maximum average is not changing, okay? So the HDI maximum, it's not changing, okay? So that's the second scenario. In the third scenario, I would say it's the, the best one. Th these three things are happening increase in the average HDI, uh, decrease of dispersion, okay, and also increase, uh, sorry, this one, increase in uh, maximum HDI, okay, so uh, the best scenario, development scenario is scenario number three, sorry for the Portuguese in this line, okay, and this plan, we, we plan to obtain this development, that, okay, uh, the situation here at this level is the expected situation at this year, 2050, okay, and the study uh, we made in 2013, okay. So these are our three scenarios. Uh, let's uh, try to calculate the corresponding energy demand, okay. So, uh, in numbers, okay, the, those are the, the parameters. Uh, that's our reference in 2013. 
in PLE. Okay, and remember, we had this for each city in PLE. Okay, I'm, I'm showing simply the, the average numbers. So the HDI, the average HDI in 2013 was 0 0.5. Okay. Uh, yeah, f let me go. Uh, so in scenario one, that's the expected increase for the three scenarios. Okay. Uh, the difference, sorry, you, we have a problem here. This is sigma, okay, dispersion. Okay, so uh, the, the dispersion, you see, is uh, moving to 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 in scenario number three, okay. Um, yeah, that's the maximum IDH. You see, in the second scenario, it's not changing compared with uh, the same number in 2013, okay? And here you have the maximum. Uh, well, th this table is just to give you the, the actual numbers, but uh, the, the tendencies are, I think, better represented down here, okay? So scenario number one, let me get my pointer. Scenario number one, the, the average IGDH is increasing, okay, dispersion is not changing, okay, and maximum IDH is also constant, it's not changing, okay. Scenario number two, the average IGH is increasing, dispersion is decreasing, but the maximum IDH is constant, okay. And the third scenario, everything is getting better. Uh, higher average IDH, uh, smaller dispersion, and a higher maximum IDH. So everything gets better. And scenario number zero, it's uh, our reference scenario is vegetative growth only, okay, without change in the IDH histogram, okay. So let's see, when we calculate the corresponding uh, the, the increase increased demand for the for each of these scenarios we get this result here okay and for this we used I'm going back a few slides okay for this we used uh, this formula here to calculate this okay so the results now that we have uh, IDH okay uh, let me just show in IDH is uh, what we expect in the corresponding development scenario. So we use this formula to calculate the energy or power per capita. Okay, and we do this by cities in, in the state of Piauí, and then we multiply by the population in each city. Okay, so we get these graphs here. Okay, so scenario number zero is this one. Okay, and, and those are actual numbers, 2013. And yeah, we also have uh, a, a population growth model. Okay, we also had this. I see somebody's asking me if this is our last class. Uh, I see the message here. And uh, yes, this is our last class. I, I forgot to, to tell you this. This is our last class. Um, yeah, thanks for correcting me, for reminding me to, to say this. Uh, so this is scenario number zero, and that's the energy in megawatts related to the state of Piauí only, okay? So you see scenario number two, scenario number three. And this is, um, I forgot to mention, we also have a, a, a population growth model, okay, based on statistics. Okay. So that's the, the, what we expected for these, what we expect for these three scenarios, okay? And as I mentioned, the investments should be planned to enable a controlled supply growth, which prevents problems related to over and or under investment, okay? As I mentioned. And this is the actual supply. So you have these curves, okay? The, the baseline and the well, three different scenarios, they work as limits. And when you do this planning, the idea is that 
you have something that is limited okay by these these curves by doing this you avoid uh, for instance this problem uh, in poe it's it was mostly over investment actually okay but you may also have today in my opinion we are we are having under investment in this area okay uh, yeah so those are the numbers okay ah, and another thing important thing there are some very important things in this slide uh, yeah let me get my my pointer uh, first let, let me explain before explaining these numbers let me explain a few things first when we talk about energy demand uh, when we say about energy you have to specify what kind of energy do you need when you talk about energy we're not only talking about electricity this is a very common mistake that people make okay when you talk about energy they think about electricity only so uh, demand total demand okay means uh, roughly speaking three things electricity or those are the vectors okay energy vectors are energy carriers so um, total power is uh, is composed of electricity fuel for the transportation and eventually heat especially for industrial processes because you don't have to heat uh, homes and uh, buildings especially in Piaui, okay? Uh, and if you want to refrigerate, if you want to cool, if you want to have air conditioning in Piaui, you're going to need electricity, okay? So when we talk about total energy demand, we can break this down in three parts, electricity, fuel, and heat. Uh, I think it's clear now, okay? Fuel, because you have to to supply your whole transportation sector okay and for this study we use these numbers okay this this uh, share 16.9 uh, for electricity okay uh, 35.3 fuel and 47.8 heat okay so that's uh, how we are going to break down uh, this affects for instance in the uh, the interior parts of PLE, the energy is more rela related to uh, fuel because uh, you have a, agricultural, a very strong agricultural sector in that region. So you have to have fuel, okay? And uh, at the coast of PLE, you need, for instance, where you expect to have uh, uh, large investments in tourism, you need, for instance, air conditioning illumination and so on so the share in that region is uh, more significant another yeah and and this links to another thing that i want to explain to you is that uh, the state of poe in an administrative point of view may be divided is divided in one two three four one two three four um, administrative regions okay so what we call Litoral Coast, uh, Mid North, okay, Cerrado, which is a, which is a, I don't know how to translate this, but it it's the the place where the agriculture is supposed to be more intensive. It's a very appropriate um, region for agriculture, okay. And Sertão is a semi-arid region. It's almost a desert in this this region, okay. And, but I already mentioned, it's very interesting for wind generation. Chapada do Aradipe is here in Sertão. Okay, so using, I'm going back one slide, using those models for the increase in demand, okay, and uh, our three scenarios, so that's the amount of megawatts that we expect by different regions here, okay. So, and those are actual numbers, the, the numbers used uh, in POE. So let's see how things happened, because that was our planning. So let's see how things happened. Okay, you see, uh, you see that uh, actually POE, because, especially because of Chapada do Aradipe, 
the amount of investments until 2000, uh, no, uh, November 2013 was way above even the most optimistic scenario, which is this uh, green curve here. Okay. And well, this plateaus because simply because I didn't update the data here. Okay, I'm going to show you an updated uh, graph corresponding to this. So this is what hap was what was happening at that time. Okay, and the conclusions is that uh, you know I summarized them here. The electrical energy PoE, okay, is typically and has a, a, has a very interesting potential to become and is already an electrical energy exporter okay especially in wind and photovoltaics because uh, especially in Chapada do Araripe the winds are intense and regular enough and also the price of uh, land is low because it's a semi-desert area okay uh, to, to make this kind of, of generation. And also photovoltaics is very good because, well, PoE is near the equator and it also has a, a capacity factor related to a small amount of clouds. So it's very, very interesting for photovoltaics generation. Another important conclusion is that uh, uh, demand for other vectors or car energy carriers is higher for a smaller IDH. Okay, that means that uh, less developed cities will experience uh, the greatest the greatest jumps in terms of uh, delta HDIs. Okay, so the increases proportionally will be higher in these cities for all three scenarios. This is uh, another way of saying that we want to uh, to develop more the cities and regions that are less developed when we compare this with, for instance, uh, Teresina, which is the capital, which is already uh, well developed. So it's good to have development, social development in Teresina but we expect to have uh, a more intense development in these uh, regions, okay, less developed regions. Uh, another point is that vehicular fuel, uh, you have to have the product, production of this fuel, it's, that's the ideal case, okay, production near the consumers, okay, to avoid uh, logistic cost. That means uh, since the region, especially this region, Cerrado, is very good for agriculture. The idea is to produce some kind of biofuel in that region and use this biofuel, biodiesel or, or ethanol, and use this fuel to, uh, for the transportation, for, for transporting the, the, the agricultural feeds, the, the agricultural products to processing industries. Okay? So the idea is to produce this fuel in that region in order to avoid increasing costs related to logistics. Okay. Uh, another point, interesting point related to, uh, I'm going to show you those regions in the map, is the possibility of integration of wind and biorefinery, since I'm talking about biorefinery here. Okay. So those are the portfolios corresponding to the three scenarios. So this is the first scenario. Those are the administrative regions. Just to show you the kind of, uh, of result that you get with this uh, type of planning. Those are the th four regions. And those were the most indicated place to build this kind of um, uh, energy generation unit. Okay, so in uh, semi-arid regions, we incentivated wind energy, eolian energy, Okay, in the Cerrados, we we suggested using actually 1G or traditional sugarcane industries, and nothing in the uh, mid north and uh, at the coast because these regions have the highest HDH in the PoE. So when you define this, you get numbers in terms of of money. Okay, so that's the amount of money, okay, 
the, the amount of uh, economic resources necessary for these projects here. So, okay, almost one billion reais. Uh, and that was the first scenario. The second scenario, so the difference, uh, nothing at the coast because it's not necessary. Uh, still wind power plants at, um, at Chapada do Aripo, or the, the semi-arid region. And at the Cerrados, we are proposing, we proposed actually, uh, first, second generation biorefineries. Okay, and the idea of having second generation is um, because in addition to fuel, you can produce you can produce other uh, chemical products here. Okay, very interesting. For instance, for industries that are uh, processing the the material that the agricultural products that are being produced here. Okay, so for this scenario, you you need a little bit more than one billion reais, 1.3 billion reais, and the third scenario the most optimistic one, okay? Uh, the only difference is having a, a thermal power plant, a natural gas power plant at this place here, at Kokais, okay? In the mid-north. And this is because you have a gas pipeline pi passing by this region, okay? So that's the idea and the amount of money necessary was roughly 2 billion reais. So that's what we calculated at that time. And when we look at the maps, so that's, uh, sorry, that's the coastal region, the what we call mid-north, okay, semi-arid, and Cerrados, this region here. And those are the, the investments, uh, wind power plants and uh, 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 natural gas power plant and so on. Okay. So, uh, in terms of um, uh, placement of these investments, you can see this in this map. And as I mentioned, this is re also related, but I'm not showing the details, to several other projects, strategic projects, such as uh, tourism here in the Chapada do Araripe. Uh, also, uh, projects related to the transportation sector. You have uh, a railroad proposed to be built in, in the central part of POE. The one that is already uh, planned will pass by the river here, okay? But the idea is to, to, uh, trans, to, to put this railroad in the middle of the state, okay? Uh, yeah, that, that was the, the portfolio. Let's see how things happen. And I'm using this uh, this slide here to, to talk about uh, the data that we have from, from CCEE. I talked about CCEE in the last class, okay? So I talked about this spreadsheet, okay? Uh, and this actually happened in PLE, and the uh, those numbers are already up to date, at least, well, they have almost one year now. Yeah, almost two years, and I have to... to uh, put this up to date. But this is the investment, okay? And this is a picture of one of our meeting with people from uh, government, okay? And this happened in uh, be beginning of 2014. And those were the investments before this strategic plan, okay? And after this plan, you see the, the investments peaked, okay? You see that, uh, well, they are very attractive. These, these are actually very attractive. Um, the interesting thing is to compare this result, because this black curve here is related to POE only. And the idea now is to compare this result to what happened in Brazil, in Brazil, except POE, especially because you have the effect of that uh, uh, mandate uh, obliging the companies to renegotiate all contracts, energy contracts. So this is uh, what's happening in Piauí. Uh, and those are the, the limits 
corresponding to each scenario. Okay, so uh, you see, uh, we were remember we were in 2014, so we expected to attain uh, the necessary amount for scenario two. Okay, in one year. Okay, which uh, this is a great result because we expected to obtain this demand only in 2050. Okay, uh, and a few years later we could be attaining the necessary demand for scenario one. This is fantastic because we expected to attain this only in 2050 and uh, with uh, a little bit more we could be attaining the necessary demand for scenario three, the most optimistic one. Okay, and this reflects the fact that uh, we're having overinvestment in PoE. So if you manage, if these companies that are investing here in PoE manage to sell this energy to other places in Brazil, okay. If not, they're going to close and you're going to have that problem. You have to have problems in, in supplying all this energy. But this is a great result. Now let's compare this with Brazil. Okay, so that's what happened in Brazil. And remember, in 2013, um, the government passed this, this, it's not a bill, it's a mandate, okay? And you see the, the overall investment declined strongly. There, there's a, there was a long, a very strong decline in the investment. Okay. And uh, I don't know if you managed, sorry, let me go back. I don't know if you managed to see, but uh, after, let me get a different color here. You have this strong decrease here, and then it uh, goes up again, but the rate is less than what we had before. Okay, so the rate is uh, is uh, smaller. That means that we may be having under under investment. We are not uh, feeling any problems until now because we uh, also had economic recession. Okay, so the demand is not growing as expected, but also the investments. And so when you compare this with PRE, that's fantastic because it increased. Well, this plateau here is because I don't have uh, data anymore. We still have some some bids to to add to these statistics, but so the problem is, is this plateau here is is not a problem actually. Okay, but you see when you compare, for instance. This the rate of investment compare in PoE. So this is comparable to this. Okay, and in Brazil as a whole, you see that uh, it's uh, a lot less. Okay, so this indicates that we may be having under investment, which means that if we get out of economic recession, we may experience some problems in supply because our demand is going to increase and right now we are having this type of problem here okay so this is very very significant result which concerns not only PoE but also uh, Brazil okay so the point here is that PoE is actually an energy exporter it uh, when you look at this spreadsheet for instance uh, you have all kinds of, of data. The ones that produce. So if you filter this, uh, yeah, I'm, I cannot show you this in this slide. But if you filter PoE, you're going to see the buyer. You you have buyers in all over Brazil, even in the Rio Grande do Sul. Okay, so uh, it's uh, an actual energy exporter PoE. Another very important point is uh, well we clearly are having a depressed supply okay because we have under investment especially when we compare this period with this period and this may represent a very interesting opportunity because if you believe that we're going to get out of economic recession and 
we're going to start growing at uh, two, three, or let's say even four or five, seven percent a year. Okay? That means that energy is going to to pressure. Okay, Th this increased demand is going to pressure uh, the price of energy. So this may be a very interesting opportunity for you to invest right now. Okay, yeah. So uh, let's try to generalize a little bit more. Uh, this problem related to supply growth to meet increased demands due to life quality improvements may affect also other indicators, not only energy. I want to generalize a little bit more, okay? Because, well, I'm using those case studies only to talk about these things, but let me not... Uh, uh, be restricted to this case study. So I want to show you simply some other examples slash indicators. For instance, production of light vehicles by countries. There's a very interesting uh, phenomena here. So you see those are the, the number of cars in, in millions of vehicles here, millions of vehicles, uh, by year and by country. Okay, so you see China, uh, Europe, United States, and so on, France, and the ones that I want to highlight is China, United States, and the total. Okay. Uh, you see, because you, you, I'm sure you are aware uh, of the strong development, economic, but also social development in China. Okay. So uh, when you compare these numbers, you see a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, well, it's easier to, to see in terms of graphs. So you see that's the total number. The, the black curve, that's a total number of cars. You see that's the price related to, to 2008. Okay. You see the United States suffer a lot with this price, so it decreased, and then it uh, retook here. But there was an inversion here. Okay. You see that China is now uh, is producing more cars than the United States. And this is a very important phenomenon because, uh, well, United States already have a, a very um, good quality of life in terms of HDI. But China is increasing strongly and you expect this to happen also in, in India, in Brazil, Indonesia and so on. Okay, so this, this means that uh, it's like, like the less developed cities in Piauí. Okay, the developing countries are experiencing very significant increasing, increases in quality of life. So uh, the changes is go are going to be very significant, uh, both in terms of energy, cars, and also other indicators. Okay. Uh, and this is light vehicles. If you see, if you look at the data related to fuel consumption, for instance, since China, China, for instance, uh, they are becoming a worldwide exporter. So they are demanding a lot of energy related to the transportation sector. Okay, so this is a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, so uh, to summarize, the strong per capita demand increase in the developing countries may represent, uh, may bottleneck, okay, may, may become a bottleneck in terms of, especially in fuel supply for the transportation sector, because these countries, China, this, uh, Chile is a very good example. They are becoming more and more integrated um, in, t in commercial terms to the world. Well, China, not in political terms, but in commercial, yes, of course. So they are demanding a lot of energy related to transportation sector, so fuel. They demand fuel, okay? And this is very, very um, dependent on the petroleum geopolitics because we still don't have uh, fuel as I hope to pass, have passed this idea for you guys uh, we still don't have um, a renewable energy carrier renewable fuel for the transportation sector at the scale at the amounts that that are necessary for worldwide commerce for instance so the petroleum geopolitics um, played, uh, is playing, and will play a very important role in this problem. And this is very, very 
nicely and beautifully described in Daniel Jurgen's book. That's why I really recommend you to read these books, this, those two books. Okay. Okay. Le uh, let's uh, move on. Yeah. Well, this uh, Sankei, just to to emphasize, to give you more uh, justification of of what I'm saying, more more. Um, uh, more evidence of what I'm saying. Okay, you already know. Okay, that um, the the predominant fuel energy carrier for the transportation sector is petroleum. Oh, sorry, I forgot to to interrupt my Dropbox. Uh, so you see, that's why uh, I state in the previous slide that petroleum geopolitics is going to play a very important role. Yes. Uh, uh, Sorry, how uh, how was that? How was how was the quality of life index? Does that mean it was this? Uh, from the average population or, or ah. ah you you're talking about you're, you're talking about uh, in Brazil in as a whole or because the no, no. no in the proposal you discussed one of uh, the first slide uh, the first discussion we had mm -hmm. regarding a project uh, in the state in Brazil uh, you, you mentioned the uh, quality of life in there. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm not uh, being able to understand your question. <laughs> Can you elaborate a little more? Okay, uh, my question is this: um, one of the projects that we handled in, in the state in Brazil, yeah, you you mentioned quality of life in there. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I understand. I don't have this number actually here, and I don't remember uh, right now. I had this in my hands, but uh, I don't remember. So I'm. What I'm going to do? I'm going to 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 try to retrieve this material if you're curious about it, and I'll send it you to uh, it to you. Okay. 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 Sorry for because I simply don't remember. Uh, so let's talk about another point. I, I see that uh, I'm spending too much time actually. So let's talk about energy security very quickly. Okay, when you talk about energy security, um, some aspects are, are of most concern. First, the physical integrity of facilities. Okay, or well, those. Uh, what we call, what people call the three dimensions of energy security. The physical integrities of facilities, uh, systemic fragility, and, uh, well, this is very important, cyber terrorism. Okay? Uh, examples. Uh, this uh, happened in 2013. Okay? And, uh, well, terrorists managed to, to, uh, to make hostages in this refinery. So it's a very, in Algeria, so very um, in the production stopped. So in this have a very this has a very huge impact because you see the importance of these uh, uh, these facilities. Okay, the, the integrity of facilities of production facilities, but also in terms of distribution infrastructure. I'm going to show you this in a moment. Uh, the other point is related to systemic fragility, and those are. Uh, for instance, uh, when you talk about electricity, systemic fragility, if people think in terms of electricity, systemic is related to the very common uh, undesirable blackouts. This is a very uh, illustrative one in the United States. Uh, we also, well, we had some here in Brazil a few years ago, very, very uh, important. Uh, and also, yeah, 
uh, I don't want to talk only in terms of electricity. I want also to talk about petroleum because as I hope I have managed to pass the idea, petroleum is a very important um, and strategic product for the transportation sector. So when you look at petroleum, and I have a map here, you see petroleum is produced in a few regions in, in the world, in Middle East and so on, in the United States, Venezuela here. Uh, and this product has to be transported throughout the world. Okay, something very significant happen, happen may happen here. That's the Strait of Hormuz. I think I have a, a close up here. So I think one third of the world petroleum production passes through this strait here, which is the Strait of Hormuz. Okay, and this, yeah, 35%, I have the number here. So 35% of petroleum tankers pass through the Strait of Hormuz here. Okay, let's see where is this Strait of Hormuz. It's in this region here. So let's zoom. Yeah, you see, because I want to see this, this country here. So I'm going to pause the movie. Yeah, Iraq. Okay, so you see... Why I say this is a problem? Because you have Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, okay? So you see the quantity of problems that you have in these regions, related to military problems, social problems, and so on. So if something happens and uh, they, for some reason, for some reason, block this strait, you have an impact on 35% of the world uh, distribution. Okay, so it's a very, very sensitive place. So uh, the foreign politics of, of, of the United States, of the most uh, important countries, um, have a, a very strong importance because you see the sensitivity here. So it's a very good thing that Iran today situation there is okay in terms of uh, its integration in in the world politics okay uh, but it would be very interesting to have the same here in Pakistan and so on I Iraq is, is still a problem Saudi Arabia well it's a monarchy so it's very very tightly controlled but you you also have problems here with other countries okay but the Strait of Armuts I don't know if I, I still have a more intense zoom there yeah yeah, when you go to, to Google, you, you can click here, you, you can see pictures of the installations. Yeah, that, okay, that, that's the Strait of Hormuz. It's a very, very narrow strait, so it's a very sensitive place. Okay, another problem related to cyber terrorism, they managed to, to block Saudi Aranco. I don't know if you know Saudi Aranco. Saudi Aranco. It's the, I don't know if, if it's the largest company in the world, but compared to Petrobras, for instance, I don't know, today, 2017, it must be something like 15 times bigger than Petrobras here in Brazil for you to have an idea of the size of this company. So it's like uh, managing to, to completely stop a company of the size of 15 Petrobras. Okay, so it's a very, very um, sensitive problem, cyber terrorism. Okay, so, and those are actual, that's why I put the, the newspaper uh, printout here, because those are actual stories. Those are things that really happen in the world. Okay, so cyber terrorism, uh, because they know that uh, this is very sensitive, it's a very important concern in terms of energy security. Okay, and well, we, you have some information here. I think, uh, I don't know if you, everybody know, I already posted a link on our, our page in Facebook for you to download all the, all the presentations of this course. Okay, if you have problem, if you don't uh, uh, manage to, to download this presentation, please tell me so and I'm going to try to solve the problem. Okay, so let me move on. Another concern, as I mentioned, is related to climate change. Uh, since we had already a class de dedicated to this subject, I, I can uh, go faster now. So you already know that uh, by pumping 
fossil fossil biomass uh, in the form of petroleum gas and coal from the underground to the atmosphere this impacts uh, the chemical constitution of our atmosphere so we can see this okay uh, the current concentration of co2 is attaining 400 ppm and this is no doubt about it, uh, due to our activities in the world. Uh, the, the question is if this is going to influence climate in uh, the short term. Okay? Because we already know that climate is, is changing. Okay? It, it has been changing since the beginning, but we don't know the influence of uh, uh, so quick uh, alteration here. Okay, we don't know this. This is a problem. And well, these slides are from, from our first class. Uh, just to mention that uh, what people are doing in terms of trying to, to put a limit on, on the average increase of temperature, 2.5, and here I'm explaining how this number is calculated. Okay, so you get all climate models they, they produce uh, forecasts, and since they are different, they, they consider things differently, you have a distribution, and the average distribution of these models is correspond to 2.5 in 100 years. Okay, so that's why uh, we estimate that that's going to be the, the increase that we are going to experience in 100 years. This is uh, okay. It's uh, tolerable, I would say, because, well, it's, it was the state of Sao Paulo, for instance, may become impossible to develop agricultural activities in the state of Sao Paulo, but in Siberia, we will possibly be better if the temperature increases a little bit. Okay, so 2.5 is tolerable. It's going to produce uh, very significant changes but those changes are, are changes that we can adapt. Okay, we're, so we're not going to keep planting bananas in the equator. We're going to plant bananas in the in uh, Norway, for instance. Okay, because of this uh, small increase here. As I mentioned, having a six degrees increase in temperature, this is uh, an extinction. The, it probably will, it, it will trigger climate changes so intense uh, that will make life on Earth very, uh, very hard to cope. Okay, especially our species. I mean, especially our species. Okay. Well, uh, we already calculated this. This is a very interesting slide from from one of the, our classes. Uh, if we managed to develop the magic machine, not a magic in terms of uh, energy consumption, but if we manage to, to develop a machine that uh, gets CO2 from the atmosphere and somehow stores that, okay, traps this somehow, uh, the amount of energy for this machine in order to uh, get or to, to reconstitute the, the atmospheric constitution of the 1800s, for instance, the amount of in, the amount of energy to do this we calculated correspond to only 10 days of electricity consumption. Well, of course, this is the minimum, the theoretical minimum amount of energy. So, you, but if you multiply by by 10, for instance, it's uh, it's feasible. Okay, having 100 days of energy consumption, it's feasible, not impossible, because it would be impossible if we get a result something like 1,000 years of energy consumption. This is non-feasible. Okay, so it's okay. And this magic machine, as I mentioned, you know what it is? It's biomass. Okay, because biomass does exactly this, and this energy may be supplied by the sun. We know this. Okay, so it's feasible. I'm very optimistic. Uh, it's feasible, feasible from the technical point of view, but not from the economical point of view. Because to do this, well, you're not going to be able to make money out of this. Okay, so it's not happening because, well, it's uh, people have other things to do.
Okay. Uh, yeah, those were concerns in this uh, summit. Uh, that's uh, in Paris, okay, in 2015, uh, the summit on, on climate change. And the, the good news was that uh, uh, if possible, okay, I'm, I'm mixing Portuguese, French, and uh, yeah, this slide don't have Portuguese, but you have something in English and French in France. So the good news was that uh, it would be interesting to reduce even more the amount of the, the, the temperature increase, possibly to 1.5. Okay. Uh, in the, I'm going back on one slide. And to do this, to attain this reduction, okay, uh, you should have, you must have uh, this kind of process processes that are negative in terms of carbon balance okay so uh, they those were uh, their scenarios okay so and the first one is what they call business as usual that means doing nothing nothing to to stimulate uh, emissions uh, re reductions okay so the the expectation is to attain 900 ppms in 100 years if uh, nothing is done and, and this uh, is very likely to happen especially because petroleum especially petroleum is, is still still very cheap okay uh, well they have as as I showed you they have several scenarios but the one corresponding to a two degree path okay which would take us back to the to well actually maintain the the equivalent of, of uh, 475 ppms of co2 okay so that's the the path the two degree path and uh, the one thing that is becoming more consensual is that uh, in order for this to happen you have to have more processes that are negative in terms of carbon balance Okay. Uh, in terms of what each country have to do in order to, to cope with these recommendations, so this is a very interesting slide from this, uh, from this report uh, because, well, different countries have different problems and different uh, potentials, I would say. So, for instance, uh, the United States, in order to, to cope with these recommendations here, not, not this one, but this one, the two-degree path. Uh, for instance, let's take the United States. So the United States should be investing, the, well, you see this pie graph, in energy efficiency, okay? So programs dedicated to energy efficiency. Uh, they should be, since they have a lot of coal power plants, uh, old coal power plants, they should invest in uh, making them more efficient also investing in renewable energies, methane reduction, and so on. So see, this is interesting because you see more or less the picture of the country. Latin America, okay, efficiency is very important, especially in Brazil, because here in Brazil, our industrial sector is well developed, and, and uh, some, especially some sectors of the industrial sector are quite old, actually, so energy efficiency plays a very important role here. Renewables, not as much as in the United States, because especially Brazil, we already have uh, a good amount of renewables energy, or renewable energies, okay? So it's more important here in Brazil to invest in efficiency because renewables are already uh, in place, I would say. Okay, so this is, I'm not going to spend more time here, but this is a very interesting slide. It's, if you get uh, this report, you can read in detail. It's a very interesting report to read because it gives you a, a very good idea of uh, the potentials and, uh, and problems of each, uh, of each uh, country, of each region in the world. Okay, uh, uh, Russia, for instance, uh, has an important problem related to methane emissions okay because the permafrost as i mentioned already in some of my class some of my classes 
that you have the, perm the permafrost is defrosting, so you have a release of methane. So something, I don't know if something could be done, but methane is a very important problem in, in Russia. Uh, yeah, uh, it's still in the proposed action to reduce greenhouse gases emission until 2030. So related to energy efficiency, this relates to when you break this down to industry, how to have more efficient industries in terms of energy use. Also transportation, we covered this in one of our classes and buildings. Okay. Um, as I said, coal power plants, you can retrofit. You have old power plants that are uh, coal power plants that are inefficient. You can uh, render their, them more efficient, but you can do more. You can retrofit to CCS machines. Okay, so you can change, for instance, the boiler to an oxy fuel boiler, and so you can produce uh, supercritical CO2, as I already elaborated. Uh, a lot actually. So renewables are related to development of new technologies. Second generation ethanol is a very good example of this, but also of deployment. I don't know if you remember, I showed you the slides of the number of, of refineries, biorefineries in the world. You can, uh, less than 10 actually, and the number of petroleum refineries in the world, several thousands. So uh, the idea, if you want to replace this by renewables, so you, this means that you have to have uh, thousands of biorefineries, even more, because as I explained it, uh, there will never be very, very big ref biorefineries because of the production. Biomass production is always distributed on the cultivation area. So this means that biorefineries will always be small compared to uh, petroleum refiners. Okay, methane is related to landfills, coal mines, fermentation, and so on, and also subsidies. Okay, subsidies so on fossil sources in vulnerable countries. Because of the thing I told you in the beginning, uh, these vulnerable or less developed countries, uh, they have to experience uh, uh, significant le leaps in terms of IG IDH. So if you um, if you um, force them to, to, be, to, to invest in renewables, for instance, uh, you may hamper the social development. So the idea is to subsidize these countries uh, so that uh, these technologies become affordable for these countries. And to conclude this slide, since there are no red ribbons to cut related to energy efficiency, all these uh, measures here, I would say, the problem is that politicians, uh, they tend to, well, they, they are always in favor, but in practice they ignore, simply ignore these things. Okay? They, they don't say they are against these things. Okay? And this makes sense for them because, uh, well, what moves a politician? Votes, okay, to be elect. So if these things become a value in terms of uh, getting votes from people, they will be moved to do th something, even the, if there are no red ribbons to get. That's my point in this slide. Okay? So let me pass to the second uh, case study. I can uh, go faster now because things uh, already elaborated these things uh, in previous classes. Uh, which is a multi-objective optimization of a 1G, 2G sugarcane meal uh, integrated to an oxy fuel boiler for the production of supercritical CO2. Okay, this actually the, the full results you can see in this paper. Okay, you can download it if you are interested in this uh, subject. Uh, so the idea, as I mentioned, the idea is to retrofit. Uh, typical sugarcane industry, which a typical sugarcane industry is actually this, 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 okay, the uh, sugarcane, ethanol, and or sugar, plus, I would say, a boiler and a generator 
to produce electricity. So this is a typical sugarcane mill, a first generation sugarcane mill. And what you can do, well, first you can integrate a second generation process in order to sacrifice biomass to increase production of sugar to eventually increase ethanol. And you can also uh, add other things here. For instance, uh, in order to produce supercritical CO2, you're going to need an oxyfuel boiler, which means you're going to need an oxygen production unit, which consumes energy. It's this delta here. So it's interesting to have, for instance, a production of oxygen from the nutrients in Venice here. It's becoming polluted, my slide, but uh, you already saw this in previous classes. So the idea is to, to do this, okay? Uh, so let's see the problem. Uh, I'm going back one slide because I forgot something. We already analyzed this model, okay? We actually, we uh, made an exergy analysis of this process and we know it's feasible and so on. Now let's uh, approach the problem from a different uh, perspective. From a perspective, or not, not, a, not from a perspective of someone who is designing the process, but from the perspective of someone who has to run the process, operate the process, okay? From the operator, from the, the pilot of the airplane, okay? So let's see, what's the problem? Uh, I'm going back one slide. The products here are, let me get another color, the, the ones that we have uh, revenues from and that are related to energy. So ethanol, okay, and exergy. And also, uh, yeah, and, sorry, I forgot to, and supercritical CO2. Okay, related to energy and uh, the climate change. So uh, the guy who has to run this facility, he thinks in, in terms of three coordinates, which he wants to maximize. So supercritical CO2, ethanol, and electricity. Okay, the, so the idea is to work uh, the most distance as possible of this point here. Okay, so that's this point corresponds to the maximum production of electricity, the maximum production of supercritical CO2, and the maximum production of ethanol. Okay, the maximum in terms of the stoichiometric calculations, for instance, or in terms of uh, energy balance, overall energy balance, for instance. Okay. Uh, question, is it possible to have simultaneously the maximum amount of ethanol, maximum amount of supercritical CO2, and maximum production of electricity? Simultaneously, okay? No, of course not. Okay, so uh, the operator, if you have Homer Simpson as the operator of this facility, he, he thinks to be very smart, so, well, very easy. I'm going to work on this point here, okay? But the point, you know, I, I already uh, made the calculations for you, it's not possible. So what, what is possible is to work, the best that you can do is to work on a, on a, on a frontier, which are, is represented by this surface here, okay? So this, this uh, limiting surface in this graph is due to uh, physical conservation laws, especially energy and mass conservation laws. And uh, well, so that's uh, actually our uh, Pareto frontier, and it represents the, the optimum in a multi-objective perspective. Okay, so this is the problem. Where to operate in this region? Or how to set the, my control variables in order to operate in one or 
point or region of the Pareto frontier. Okay. So in more elaborate words, the problem is this one. Let's read because it, it's more, more simple like this. So the operator deals with a control problem. And the control problem is the following. Given the nominal operation, operating conditions, in terms of uh, environmental temperature, biomass composition, and so on. So by nominal conditions, I mean the conditions, the, the definitions used to design the process. Okay? So given these conditions, these numbers, in terms of uh, temperature, biomass composition, and so on, what is the best configuration of the control variables? For instance, the temperature inside the boiler and so on what is the best configuration of control variables that increases the probability of operating near the Pareto frontier and you know uh, the Pareto frontier is the multi-objective optimum okay so that's the what we call control problem how do we solve this problem I'm going to show you uh, the idea, so, is to consider your process as a, a kind of a mathematical function. And uh, in this case, uh, the problem is going to be solved through what we call Monte Carlo simulation. Okay. So, uh, if you consider, now I, I need you to think in terms of mathematics, function, okay, a function, a mathematic function. So uh, our process actually corresponds to a function that, have, uh, that has um, several variables as, as um, arguments. I don't know if the word is proper in English, but uh, so these are the variables of this uh, function. Uh, these variables define or somehow they influence the outputs which are the production variables okay uh, the the input variables may be divided in um, we can call process variables they are stochastic in nature meaning that you cannot control uh, you cannot specify the exact value you you can only specify a range or a, a probability distribution of that value. Okay. Uh, we also have, uh, among the input variables, you can have what we call control or decision variables. You can call them parameters. And they are deterministic in nature. For instance, uh, you can set the temperature, the combustion temperature, you, you set in your, your control system and the system is going to, to, to uh, autonomously change in order to keep the temperature at that value that you, that you set. So that's mean, this means that this variable is deterministic. Okay? So that's why you, you can call this a parameter. And the production variables, of course, uh, they are the variables from which you generate revenue. Uh, in this case, uh, ethanol, electricity, and supercritical CO2. Let's move on in terms of uh, mathematical representation. So, um, to be more specific, th those variables that are stochastic may be, uh, for instance, fiber content, water content of biomass, sucrose content, and so on. You have nominal values from which you designed you based your design on which you based your, your design uh, but in practice you cannot control these variables the, the fiber content of biomass is always changing depend on the depending on the sun or uh, and so on okay um, those are variables that you can set so they you can control for instance uh, as I said, the temperature in the boiler, but in this case, what's more important is the baguette straw mix for burning. You see here, uh, you have you have <clears throat> uh, you have a certain amount of straw that is being sent to be burned, and a certain amount of straw that is 
sent to the second generation path. The same for Bagase. So this valve here, though this is a three-way valve, okay, you can set, you can control. For instance, 80%, 20%. You can define this number. Okay, that's the Bagase uh, mix for burning or straw mix for burning. And the output variables, ethanol, supercritical CO2, and electricity. Okay. From a mathematical point of view, let's give names to these things. So those stochastic variables actually is a vector, a vector x. The control variable, we may call this a vector c, and the output variables y, vector variables. Okay. Uh, and our process may be represented like this, like a mathematical function, multidimensional function, okay, uh, that projects the input variables to the output variables. So our process is this function f here. And I'm making the difference uh, x and c, the stochastic and deterministic ones, because these ones we can act on. We can change the, the boiler's temperature, for instance, but we cannot change the fiber content. We expect the fi fiber content to be between certain limits, but that's the maximum that we can have. We cannot set, well, the fiber content has to be 13%. It's going to vary during the, during the year, okay? But those variables here, you can, yes, you can, uh, define them. Uh, and since the problem is stochastic, especially those x variables, okay, you're not talking about um, definite variables. Actually, we're going to, to think in terms of probability function. So uh, p, small p, actually is a probability function related to x, okay, probability function related to c, and that's the probability function of uh, the output variables. Okay, so you, you, it, it's a way of seeing things. Okay, the, the industrial process here is a kind of a function that is transforming input probability functions, stochastic and controllable ones. Okay, so it's transforming probability inputs to probability outputs. So that's the way you must uh, approach this problem. Okay? And that's uh, something analogous to, to what Boltzmann did in thermodynamics, uh, just to, to, to put you in perspective. So uh, I think it's easier to understand in graphical terms. Uh, as I mentioned, the control variables you can define. For instance, I can, I can uh, define that the temperature in the boiler is going to vary between limits and this variation is going to be uniform. I can define this. Okay, so this means I, I can put whatever distribution here I want. It can be something like this, uniform. If I want a fixed value, the temperature in the boiler is going to be 750 degrees during the whole year. Okay, so the distribution here is going to be a Dirac. Okay, it's going to be concent uh, perfectly concentrated here. So if I can, if it's controllable, I can do whatever I want. It's um, in for this study in particular. It's more interesting to use uniform distributions here. Uh, it's going to become clear in a while. On the other hand, the other uh, stochastic or the stochastic variables, you do not control the probability distribution. Okay? So it may resemble a Gaussian distribution. It may be something strange like this. I don't know. Uh, uh, this is uh, moisture content. Okay? Sorry, it's still in Portuguese. The moisture content may be related to um, dry season or wet season. Okay, so it it uh, it varies. It's very very dry 
during the dry season and very humid during the rains, the rainy period. So uh, the probability is probably something, uh, something like this. Okay, and so on. So those are the input probability probabilities. Okay, and they are going to uh, bring about the output probabilities. Those here. So the point is, how this, how can we uh, set these variables in order to become optimum here? That's what I'm going to show you. Uh, just to, to show you an example of the, the Pareto frontier, uh, but related to a very simple mathematical problem, I can show you this here. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm stopping the, the, the class right now just to, to make this example, to elaborate this example, to explain what is the Pareto frontier. So in this case, suppose we have two peaks, okay, like this one. The mathematical equation of this function here is a Gaussian, a, a two-dimensional two -dimensional Gaussian. It's here. Okay, so it's a Gaussian. And the first one is centered on 0, 0. And the second one is centered here, okay, in, in 4, 4. Okay. So the, suppose that our multi-objective problem is I want to be as close as possible from both peaks here. Okay, understand? So you see, it's not. Uh, it's some sometimes it's possible if uh, if I'm if I start here, it's possible to increase both object objective simultaneously, but sometimes not. If I'm here in this place, and if I go in this direction, I get closer to the blue peak, but I'm getting uh, far away from the red peak. Okay. So you, if you simulate, if you put points here in this region, you get these points. So this is the, the, the height, actually, of, of the red peak and the blue peak. And you see that there is a frontier here. Okay. There's a frontier here. So those points, which I'm highlighting here, I think I'm going to draw a line. Uh, yeah, a yellow line, for instance. So those points are what we call non-dominant points. And those are the optimum points. And uh, why they are optimum? Because you can only increase one obje objective by decreasing the other, the other one. Okay. So the, instead of having one single optimum point, you have an infinite, in this case, an infinite number of optimum points. Okay, so that's the, the meaning of a Pareto frontier. Uh, and from an operation point of view, well, you don't have to be exactly on the frontier. You may be uh, very close to the frontier. That's already uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to skip this slide because I'm talking about... Uh, the strategies to, to build this frontier. I already mentioned this in our last class, so I can skip all these slides. Yeah, uh, and, and that's the, the slide. Actually, that's the slide from, I think, the power plant that we simulated. Okay, uh, so we're going to apply this technique. We already did, actually. Okay, to simulate, to make this Monte Carlo simulation to this power plant. Uh, yeah, and uh, we are going to have two objectives, which is the total power at the turbines, and uh, yeah, the cost, the, the total cost, capex plus opex. Uh, of course, opex that means that you integrate uh, the operating cost during the the lifespan of the project. Okay. And that's the model. Okay, I already explained this to you. Uh, I want to use this slide only to explain the cost function because uh, total power is a very uh, intuitive variable, but the cost function is not, it's not um, that intuitive. So the cost function 
we are going to break it down in, in three ter ter uh, terms. Okay, uh, the first one relates to to capex, which relates to the size of the power plant or the the power unit of that industrial facility, and uh, we're going to to transform or to relate the cost. We're going to base or cost model function in the areas. So that means that we're going to relate the areas of the boiler here to the cost and through uh, empirical constant. Okay. So we already did this in, I think it was the, the second class, I explained how to obtain this constants here. So you do actually, you go to the market, you ask for prices and, and and characteristics, for instance, these areas, and then you plot the points and you fit a curve and you get this parameter here. The other component of the cost is related to materials, which is also related to capex. Uh, for instance, if the combustion temperature here in the boiler is very high, this means that uh, you have to use special materials to withstand this very high, these very high temperatures. Okay, so these uh, specialized material, they are uh, more expensive. Also, if you decide to work at higher pressures, which we know increase the power production, uh, it also implies that you have to use more resistant, especially more resistant tubes, which are more expensive. So that's why we are using two parameters to represent uh, the cost related to materials. And uh, the last component of the total cost is related to operation, which is related to fuel consumption. So we can simply correlate this to the amount of heat that is being changed here. Okay, This relates directly to fuel consumption through the heating capacity. Okay, so that's the result that we get when we apply the Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, and you see we are, we are applying this uh, optimization method, the, the one that I showed in, in one of the, our last classes. We start, well, I have actually two methods here. Uh, the black points represent an exhaustive search and I did this simply because I wanted to show you uh, to compare both methods, okay? And the other one, the reds, red yellow stars correspond to this uh, swarming ants method. That's the name of this method, swarming ants. In Portuguese we, we call this enxame de partículas. Uh, swarming particles. Uh, for some reason we don't like the, the name ants, we call it swarming particles method. Okay, so what we do, we start in, randomly in the envelope here and we go to the to the maximum. Okay, I already explained this so you already have an idea. Uh, so you get the frontier, the Pareto frontier, which is this red dotted curve here. This point represents the minimum cost point, uh, but for a very low price, you have a very low power production. This point here represents the maximum power production, but it also uh, corresponds to a, the maximum price. So if, if you have, if you want to have maximum power, you're going to uh, pay the most expensive uh, price for your power plant, because well, I'm assuming the design, the nominal, des the design is already optimized. Okay, so let me see how you use these results if you're not if you are operating the power plant, okay, but if you are selling the power plant. Uh, for instance, uh, if the guy if your client comes and say, oh, I want to, to sell 130 megawatts of power, so this number is already defined. You have an infinite number of, of design solutions. Of course, you're going to take this 
particular one, this one here, because it's the optimal. All these solutions on this line here correspond to 130 megawatts, but this point with this internal configuration represents the best one. Okay. Uh, well, you can do, for instance, you can, instead of defining a point, you can define ranges, as I'm showing you here, but this is not, in, not very interesting. What I want to focus on today is the, the operation problem, okay, uh, and also talk about rationalization, making the difference, uh, elaborating the difference between optimization and rationalization. So, let's see the problem again. We have these input variables, the output variables. This is a function. We already know that we can, those variables here are stochastic. Those are deterministic. Okay. But there is another division. I would say, I'm stating here. Okay. Uh, some of these stochastic variables are related to external feedstock. Or, as I say, Related to fiber, for instance. Fiber content, lignin content, and so on. So it's a problem of um, cost optimization. Okay, for instance, you can install at the entrance here the trucks that are delivering sugar cane. If you if you install sensors to measure, well, they are already sucrose uh, probes, but you can also measure uh, lignin content, for instance in the truck. So you can somehow uh, make different payments depending on different lignin contents. Okay. Another set of variables are internal in nature because they are related to the processes, the temperatures and flow rates and so on. So for instance, the, the cellulose yield here in the second generation uh, pathway. It will depend on the pretreatment severity and so on, and that means that you can act on through uh, a more elaborate engineering and uh, a more elaborate knowledge of your bioprocesses that are taking places here. And these, uh, what we have been, we are calling control variables, we can also look at them uh, in terms of uh, or as decision variables and those are the ones that we're going to act on to increase operation to increase performance actually so what is in this context with these ideas in mind what is energy rationalization okay uh, let me to, to, to talk about this subject yeah I have uh, uh, roughly 40 minutes to talk about this. So to talk about rationalization, I'm going to use uh, a case study. Okay, and this case is the optimization and rationalization of the production and distribution of water in Sao Carlos. Let me talk about this project. It is related to, um, as I say, to adapting to uh, instantaneous conditions, to adapting your process to uh, conditions that occur at that instant. Of course, you design, for instance, in, in this case, you, you design this avenue. This is, I don't know if you, some of you are from Sao Paulo. This is uh, Avenida 23 de Maio, and that's Ibirapuera down there, okay? So when you design these avenues, you expect to have a certain number of cars per minute or per hour to pass and but you know this vary a lot uh, really a lot those are what we call hourly variation of something it can be i'm, I'm going to back some slide forgive me hourly variation of fiber content okay how am i going to adapt the process here to cope with this variation here in order to remain optimum okay or in this case here, how am I going to change the lights, red lights and yellow lights and green lights periods in order to, uh, to adapt to this change here? Okay. That's the operation problem. Uh, you see this in, in terms, since the case is more related to, to urban areas and urban demands, 
So you have a lot of urban demands. As the picture shows, um, circulation, also energy supply, circulation of data, telephone, and so on. And the one that we're going to look today is this one, water distribution, which is also related to, actually was motivated by, by uh, the cost of energy. Uh, you see uh, why it is important to plan, to plan properly and to operate properly. This is a very good example in, in Myanmar, okay, from Burma. You see the, the guys, they expected, I don't know, uh, how, many, how many lanes here? One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think there are ten lanes on each side okay so you see the 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 amount of money that was spent to build this avenue is fantastic 10 lanes and the usage is okay terrible <laughs> so it's too much money for nothing so planning is necessary to optimize the infrastructure capacity so you define the capacity regarding the variability of the instantaneous demand. So that's exactly the problem here. It would be nice to have 10 lanes here, okay? But, well, for how much time do you have all this, uh, this number, all these cars? If it's only during, I don't know, 30 minutes a day, during uh, work days, probably it's not worthwhile to spend um, a, a mountain of money to build 10 lanes here. Because you see, especially in a city like Sao Paulo, it's not only a matter of, of uh, building these lanes, but also you have, to, uh, you have to buy the land here. So you have to, to pay for the, the land here. So it's very complicated to do this. So it's very important to, as I'm saying, to plan in order to optimize CAPEX regarding the instantaneous demand. So you need to know the instantaneous demand. So let's see how this applies to, uh, to water distribution. To talk about this, and, and especially the cost, uh, the energy cost related to water distribution. I'm focusing the the this case to this problem so we need to know how how the price is calculated here in brazil this is specific for for um, for our case here in brazil so actually here the tariff is composed of two components what we call uh, consumption and what we call demand an observation before i move on uh, I'm keeping many terms in Portuguese because these terms are specific for our case. I don't know if it applies exactly the same in, in, in the United States or in France and so on. Probably not. But that's why I'm keeping the terms in Portuguese. I'm, uh, I will be always explaining uh, these terms. Okay. So by consumption, so uh, the price is calculated like this. Consumption which is uh, the volume of energy, the, um, the physical amount of energy in megajoules, for instance, or megawatts hour. So the, the, the amount of energy consumed times the cost tariff. Okay, so the, the unit here is uh, reais per megawatt hour or kilowatt hour. Okay. So that's one component of our price. The other component, well, there are more components, but I'm going to, to be more specific in a, in a moment. The other component is what we call demand. And it, it is related to the infrastructure usage. So uh, this is energy, this is power, actually. And you multiply this by the demand tariff, and the unit is reais per megawatt. Okay, it's going to become clear in a moment, or more clear in a moment. Another observation is, this is not very, uh, probably not very familiar to some of you, because 
and we are more used to res residential supply contracts and in Brazil uh, for residential contracts demand does not uh, influence we we only think in terms for residential uh, supply we only think in terms of this term here okay but for industrial supply and commercial supply contracts you also have demand tariffs and it's it's very fair this is a problem actually uh, in my opinion we should be able to to uh, it it's uh, may sound contradictory because well are you in favor of in increasing the tariff no on the contrary if we manage to if, if in residential supply contracts we we um, uh, I mean we, we it would be uh, okay to pay for the demand we could plan our domestic use of energy for instance why do we have electric showers in Brazil because electric shower it's a uh, it's terrible in terms of, of demand because a very high power so five kilowatts seven kilowatts and this will uh, happen in a very short period of the day so it would be more interesting so we can have um, electric shower because we don't pay for our demand okay we don't pay for this uh, it would be more rational to to use a low power source and accumulate hot water in a reservoir and use that hot water during the peak hour so my demand never exceeds a certain limit uh, for instance for for uh, an average home uh, it could be something like uh, 10 kilowatts for instance okay yeah let's let's make this calculation i think it's fun. it's interesting suppose that you have one electric shower five kilowatts plus your average demand television refrigerator and so on uh, five kilowatts okay so you have to hire you you have you have a demand of 10 kilowatts kilo sorry kilowatts so what the number that's coming here is 10 times the tariff okay if if uh, so you're not going to do this because this is going to to increase a lot the cost if uh, if that's the case what you're not going to use electric shower so what are you going to do you're going to use uh, what we call an accumulator okay so you're going to produce hot water during the night for instance and uh, since you don't need a, a lot of power uh, because you have several hours to produce the amount of hot water that you need okay so you have you can use a low power source of energy for for water heating so suppose that you only need one kilowatt for hot water so instead of hiring a 10 kilowatt you only need to hire a six kilowatt demand you see so this uh, this uh, policy okay it favors both energy reduction and rationalization that's what i call rationalization that means uh, trying to use energy at the periods of the day where energy costs less you see that's the the point so let's see how this apply to the water distribution problem the the so we are on the shoes of the guy who is operating this uh, this water distribution unit so what he does he gets water from rivers or and from wells and from the water bed and so on uh, and then water is sent is pumped actually those are represent pumps okay this water uh, is pumped to reservoirs so those reservoirs you accumulate water and to put water in these reservoirs you're going to spend energy okay 
you spend energy. And then, uh, by gravity, this water goes to the, to the buildings here. So you don't need to spend energy to, to, to transport water from the reservoirs to the buildings because you already spent the necessary energy because you put water in these reservoirs. Okay, so from the, an energy perspective, in, in rough lines, that's the problem. And specifically, the, the energy problem is, uh, the energy planning problem is, um, what is the best supply contract considering some specificities? First, uh, typical water use variations during the day. Uh, it's like the avenue, the first slide, where you see Avenida 23 de Mayo, okay? A second point is uh, typical energy demand, so the peak hours. Uh, eventually, you don't want to have water sort, so, uh, um, you, sorry, you need to consider your storage capacity, the amount of reservoirs that you have, and also if, uh, consider these reservoirs uh, in terms of uh, energy storage system. You also have to consider another aspect which is not written here, which is water sh shortage. Okay, you, you don't, you can't have water shortage. Sh shortage. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. uh, my throat is already uh, in the end of its useful life. Okay, but uh, you don't, you, you want to avoid at all costs water shortage, especially in peak hours, okay? Okay, so let's move on. Uh, so from the point of view of the operator, you want to define which, which is the best contract for my application. So the guy, he, he's not uh, looking at the, the buildings, uh, except for water shortage, okay? So he's looking at the system, the water distribution system, which is uh, the pumping station here, let me erase here, which is the pumping station here, let me get my pointer, the pumping station, and the reservoirs. So, uh, what is the best supply contract, considering those aspects? For instance, this, this is an example. Uh, the red curve here represents uh, the, the demand in terms of water, okay? So that's water demand. And this is very typical, especially here in Brazil. Around 6 p.m., there is a, a huge increase in, in water demand because people um, get home, back from work, uh, they cook, they, they take a shower and so on. So water is demanded here in this period. And uh, so this, this means that you have to pump water Okay, so this will cause a, a, an increased demand also in terms of energy. So if you, if you have a, a traditional contract, okay, if you cannot plan, if you don't know uh, if your demand is, when your demand is going to occur, you have to contract this demand here represented by this blue line here. So you see, uh, this high demand, I'm going back a few slides, this, this high demand, contracted demand, will impact on cost through this uh, component here. So this is not a good situation, considering that your water demand tends to be concentrated in certain periods as energy. Okay? So what would be interesting instead of doing this, is doing this, okay? If you manage to contract a smaller demand, okay, and I'm going to explain uh, in a while this dent here, but if you are able to work with this uh, smaller demand or contracted demand, okay, you know, uh, so the contract is going to be better, you're going to get a better uh, tariff here, but you have to do something in order to uh, accommodate this situation here. You have more demand for, po for, for power, 
uh, speaking in terms of energy. Okay, what can you do? Well, you have water storage systems here. How can I use this water storage system as energy storage systems? Okay, so that's the case I'm ex explaining right now. So the problem in terms of operation is how to control reservoirs and pumps during the day, assuring water supply. Remember, you cannot have water shortage. Okay, so assuring water supply and simultaneously complying with the requirements of the energy contract with our seasonal differentiation. Okay, in Portuguese, um, uh, I think I'm, I'm going to write this down. In part, we, we, we call our seasonal um, di, uh, diferenciação, that's the same, okay? In Portuguese, é oro sazonal. Now, that's the term in Portuguese. And I'm not sure that's the correct term in English. So that's why, um, as I said, I'm, I'm, uh, keep, I'm translating the mo the best as, as I can okay uh, yeah yeah so you have to comply with the requirements of this contract and these requirements for instance may be something like this you what is stated in this contract is that you can consume energy in these periods here but you cannot consume energy between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. Okay, uh, if you do, if you if you consume energy in this period, you're going to pay a fine. Okay, you have fines associated. I'm going to show you the the tables in a moment. Okay, so you don't want to pay this fine. You're going to pay it if uh, if there's going to be water shortage, but uh, you can use these reservoirs to comply. Okay, I we're going to have water. These waters go uh, by gravity to the buildings here, so we don't need an energy in this period, actually. Okay, so that's uh, the ideal scenario. Uh, in Brazil, many things here are specific to, to our uh, country. Uh, you have several um, uh, mandates here, which are uh, organized and uh, published by the, the national electrical energy agency you have a few I, I give you the numbers and i didn't translate because well there are in portuguese they are more specific to our reality in this one here four five six uh, deals with it it defines how companies how distribution companies can bill for the energy so that formula that i showed you in the the first slide of this case is actually comes from from this uh, mandate here okay uh, yeah and and well many things are defined so for instance uh, what what is called tariff modalities there's the conventional modality which we, is the one that we use for residential contracts the hour seasonal contracts which I already explained and within the hour seasonal, you have what they call green tariff and blue tariff. I'm going to explain this in a moment. Okay. And if you break this down, you have the corresponding components. As I mentioned, you have consumption and power. Consumption is a very, very, uh, very simple. Yeah, I forgot to mention something here. You pay for consumption and also for the use of the distribution grid. Okay, it's like paying uh, uh, when you are driving on a road, you have to pay a toll, for instance. Uh, the other components relate to demand. Okay, so you have, uh, you have a single tariff related to a conventional contract. Uh, and if not, you have intra hour seasonal period, one tariff for this, and another different tariff for the out, outer, um, out of hour seasonal period. Okay. And so on. And there's another subdivision here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make a joke about this in a moment. You're going to see because it's becoming, I, I hope, 
you're starting to feel, well, this is becoming complicated. Be yeah, that's true, it is. It's more complicated than you think, okay? Uh, so we have blue tariff, green tariff, we have uh, our seasonal period and so on. And there's also uh, uh, what they call wet period tariff. That's the rainy season here in Brazil and the dry period tariff. And this is so because most of our electrical energy is from hydroelectric uh, power plants. So that's why the, the amount of rain influences a lot the energy generation. Okay. And uh, yeah, so you, you can try to put this in graphs like this. Uh, this is published by Anel, so that's why I didn't bother to translate this to Portuguese. So that's the what what is called blue tariff scheme for mostly for industrial uh, supply. Uh, that's the green tariff. Okay. Uh, yeah, you have more specificities and so on. And here is. That's if you go to this to this site, the site period, you pay 12.82 reais out of peak 8.01, and if you uh, if you consume more power than you hired, you you pay this tariff here. So you see the numbers vary a lot, 16 compared to 8 or compared to 25. So the variation in terms of, of numbers that are being used to calculate the cost, uh, they vary a lot. That, that's just an example. Okay. So the problem, now I can state the problem in terms of energy planning. The problem related to energy planning is, is it possible, do I have control, enough control over my process uh, to obtain, to, to manage, to obtain a reduction in the contracted demand? Uh, in the case of water distribution, probably yes, because I have water reservoirs. It's just a matter of how, uh, what's the strategy of using these water reservoirs. Uh, you can use these numbers to simulate the reduction, but it's easy to see since these numbers vary a lot between different contracts. It's sure that uh, if you manage to, to reduce the demand, you're going to have a strong reduction in energy cost. Okay. Uh, however, you are more exposed to risks of uh, paying fines because you may be exceeding limits and so on. The, and this happened in this actual case that I'm going to show you, I think, right now. Yeah, <laughs> it's becoming very complicated. Uh, in addition to blue tariff, green tariff, uh, our season and so on, I think the last government stated this, uh, um, green, yellow and red tariff, which is a mechanism to incentivate economies or not, depending on uh, the amount of uh, actually water in the reservoirs, water reservoirs in the hydroelectric power plants. Okay, so it's becoming really complicated. That's why Homer Simpson is, is becoming crazy. Because uh, that's a subjective aspect that, that I was mentioning in the beginning of the class. Um, well, it's becoming so complicated that the, the, tra the traditional, the average consumer, it's getting completely lost. He doesn't know what to do in order to pay less for his electricity bill because it's so complicated. Okay, and that's the same. Something very, very, very similar happened with uh, with Apple. You know, uh, the first time that Steve Jobs was, uh, let's say, uh, fired from Apple, uh, it. This company, Apple, I mean, um, started to be run, as he says in, in, in his uh, bio, uh, biographies, it started to be run by engineers. Okay, so the number of products manufactured by Apple exploded uh, to the point, this, this, is, this is an actual case, okay, to the point that uh, a consumer to, to choose a camera, for instance, you want to buy a camera or a cell phone, okay, or so you 
you had these decision trees in order to to specify a specific model for your telephone okay and this is not feasible okay because the average consumer as uh, Steve Jobs uh, used to say well consumers are not engineers okay they don't read manuals and so on and uh, uh, less um, there's they're going to follow a decision tree like this okay so what they did they stopped consuming Apple products so after when St uh, Steve Jobs came back to Apple he um, deleted all this he, ch he changed completely so uh, he, he came up with this um, idea is what we, he, he calls a four quadrant product grid okay this uh, four qua quadrant actually is, combines two things two decision levels let's say like this you have for instance uh, the average consumer and professional consumer okay so if you're buying a computer for instance you maybe uh, for for domestic use okay so you don't need nothing very sophisticated so on so that's the average consumer or non-professional consumer or if you're a professional you will probably need a more specific product and high i would say high high quality and low quality and high price and low price okay so you combine this you have four four different products so my point with this analogy is that energy in brazil is becoming like apple before the the, the return of steve jobs it's going to it, it, uh, they lost a lot of money and in brazil since our uh, our, our policy is so complicated consumer they don't respond they they are not they're completely lost so my point is or my opinion is that something like this should be done uh, in Brazil so that the consumers start to respond more appropriately okay in order to uh, for instance to make cheaper the cost of energy because since we don't do this uh, the government, for instance, in a few years, had to uh, turn on the thermal power plants in order to supply, uh, to compensate for the loss of uh, electric energy from the hydroelectric power plants, because the consumers they were simply uh, not responding properly, according to the to the environment, to the um, boundary conditions, for instance so in my my opinion that's the problem so let's uh, let's in, in a few minutes just talk about uh, how where this analysis was applied so actually yeah in uh, here is I'm talking about urban networks so we applied this in two two neighborhoods here in São Carlos uh, a smaller one which is called here uh, Douradinho and the bigger one Santa Felicia in Santa Felicia, there's probably something like 30,000 people. In Douradinho, something like 5,000 people living there. Okay. Uh, for those of you who, who know São Carlos, that's uh, Washington, Luis. Okay. São Paulo is here, and uh, Araraquara is there. And if you want to go to Ribeirão Preto, is over here. Okay. Douradinho is here. That's the where. Uh, Federal University, yeah, here, UFSCA, okay, and University of São Paulo is here. Um, I'm, I must be uh, some some place around here, <laughs> uh, right now, okay. And uh, uh, Santa Felicia is all this region here, okay. So let me explain. First, the the small neighborhood Douradinho. Uh, what's the pumping strategy there? So it's not controlled, actually. What they have in Douradinho is a well, a submersible pump, which pumps water to what we call an elevated reservoir. Okay? So it pumps to an, uh, an elevated reservoir, and if consumers need water, they get from here. 
so this graph here, for instance, represents the demand of water, flow rate, demand for water. So that's the flow rate that you measure here. And we actually did. We measure, uh, we were measuring flow rates, uh, water level, and also if the pump was on or off. Okay. So the, the strategy here is, is the following. I'm explaining how this system is operated. The demand is not controllable. It's stochastic in nature, as I was mentioning. So it varies during the day. And the pump actually works like this. Um, the next slide. You have two level sensors in the reservoirs. In the reservoir. A low level and a high level. Okay, that's the these two. So you get something like this. When the water level reaches the lowest level, it triggers the pump. So the pumps start working. It pumps water to the reservoir, okay, and the, the level increases. It, it, it increases very, very fast, okay. Then when the level reaches the maximum level, the pump is turned off. So that's it. And then uh, the, the level starts to decrease according to the demand. That's the exact same way that your water reservoirs, your residential water reservoirs work. Only that you don't have a pump, you have a, a, flo a floating a float valve. Okay, so the pump, you spend energy to recover the water level in the reservoir. Okay. So when you have periods of low demand, what happens is that the pump is activated less frequently uh, than when the pump is, uh, is used here in this period, for instance, when you have um, higher demand of water. Okay. So the frequency, the, the on-off on frequency increases during periods of high demand and this frequency on off frequency decreases during the other periods. So this is a strategy um, that's not, that's not uh, using the reservoir as the water reservoir as an energy reservoir. Okay, so the energy consumption is not controlled because it's being defined by the demand. And the demand, you don't know. It may occur at uh, 2 a.m. or at uh, 6 o'clock, 6 p.m., okay? So the energy consumption is not controlled. The pump is activated and deactivated when the high and low level sensors are triggered, okay? So that's, we're going to call this conventional, uh, conventional strategy, which requires a conventional contract of energy without our seasonal differentiation, okay? Because you don't know when you're going to spend energy. Okay, so that's how things were. What was our proposition? Our proposition was something very simple, actually, is to use, uh, actually, to change the low-level trigger. Okay, so during, during, um, during this period, Preceding the peak period, okay, we manipulated the low level period. Uh, sorry, the low level trigger. So uh, during um, starting at 12, 12 o'clock at noon to 6 o'clock, the low level trigger were, was increased progressively. Okay, and why is that? Uh, so let's read this more simple. During the day, the low level trigger is progressively increased. Now the explanation. To maximize the probability of the reservoir being full at the beginning of the peak period and consequently minimizing the probability of activating the pump during this period. Okay. So by doing this, you can, now you can, uh, sign this contract, I mean, with our seasonal differentiation.
Okay, so that's uh, what we proposed, and that's what was done actually. So those are actual numbers. We had uh, data loggers here, and those graphs that I'm showing you represent the water, the, the actual data, the water reservoir level, the level of water in the reservoir. And uh, yeah, the, the purple band here represents the, the peak period. Okay, so I'm going to zoom because I think it's more interesting. So you see during this day, okay, here we didn't have problem because by coincidence, the reservoir was almost full uh, a little while before six o'clock. Okay, so here, yeah, in this, in this example here, yeah, in this one, for instance, this is, this is a good example. So the reservoir attained its maximum level, okay, then it started to decrease, and then it was turned on again because it was almost six o'clock. Okay, and this adds a little bit more water in the reservoir, so this enables the reservoir to pass through the peak period without activating the pump. Okay, and that's the same, the same thing happened here. Okay, and well, you see various examples of this. Uh, for instance, yeah, this is a very good example. Those, uh, again, those are actual data. Okay, you see. 12 o'clock here, so you see the on-off, instead of waiting the level reach, because, uh, yeah, here I think it's worthwhile drawing something. In, in this, in this uh, example, instead of waiting for the level to reach its lowest value and then triggering the pump, okay, yeah, now I can zoom. Oh, sorry, sorry, I made something. Sorry for this. Yeah, I want to zoom here. So instead of waiting for the level to reach its minimum level, what would oblige activating the pump during the peak period? We made this on off. Okay, so we attained the starting six o'clock with a lot of water in the reservoir. So it was not necessary to activate the pump during the period. So that's an example of what I call having control over the process, uh, meaning you control when you're going to need energy. If you can do this, you can change your contract, your supply contract, in order to benefit from discounts or I don't know, whatever, but uh, you're going to be able to, to obtain a lower cost if you have control of the process. And here we have, we had, uh, because, well, the reservoir was not being used uh, in a rational manner. That's why I differentiate rationalization and optimization. Because the total amount of energy spent is exactly the same, the same, because it's related to the total time that the pump is working. Okay, so this does not change. It's just, it's just a matter of when energy is being consumed. If you can have some or total control of this, you may adapt, you may choose from uh, the best supply contract. That's rationalization. Okay, uh, more results, for instance, because those were the actual, actual uh, results, actual signals. Uh, you can put in terms of histograms just to, to, to give an average idea. This histogram is the activation histogram, the, the hour, hist hour activation histogram for the conventional strategy. So you see, this is zero, this is uh, midnight, and midnight again, okay? So you see that, um, uh, yeah, in, the, in sorry, uh, uh, mixing things up. The variable here is the reservoir level, okay, during the hours of the day for the conventional activation strategy. You see that, 
Yeah? Yeah, go on. And in this program, uh, or this project, uh, how does the consumer benefit from this? In terms of uh, cost reduction? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to show you the numbers in a few moments, okay? Okay. Thank you. I'm just comparing these two situations from the, from the process point of view. So without that uh, strategy, that new strategy, a more rational strategy, you see that uh, before, before um, 6 o'clock, 6 p.m., the probability of having 100% now, the probability was to have something like 50% in terms of water stored in the reservoir at, 12, uh, at 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. Okay? With the new strategy, the probability of having uh, more water, more than 50%, increased. Yeah, and we, all, uh, we almost had 100% uh, at 3 p.m. So this, th that's the, the new strategy. So when you do the calculations in terms of how much you are going to obtain in terms of cost reduction, when you use those numbers that I gave you, uh, cost, uh, the, the demand tariff, and so on, you get a 60% reduction. Uh, the consumers, they don't feel nothing because, well, they open the, the, the valve in their homes and they get water, so nothing changed for them. But the cost reduced. So the, the water company here in San Carlos uh, could reduce uh, a little bit the, the water bill for these per, per people here. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, another, the other one. I'm I'm trying to accelerate because I have only have a, a few minutes. The other was Santa Felice. Santa Felice is a much more complex uh, system. It has a, a well, a high power pump. 500 HP, with, which is um, more or less three, three average cars, I would say. So it's, it's pumping water from the, um, the well to a um, passage reservoir. We call that passage, uh, we call passage box. Okay, passage box. And then the passage from the passage box, a, a small pump pumps water to the reservoir. This is, this is a high power because you have a 400 meter head here. Okay, so that's, that's why the power. And that's uh, Guarani Reservoir. Uh, and that's how the system was originally designed. Uh, then they made um, another reservoir because they were experiencing uh, a lot, a lot of water short, shortage. Okay, so then they they build another reservoir and then a third reservoir. And another important aspect of this system is that it was manually operated. So uh, an employee, 24 hours a day was operating these pumps and the only one that is automatically operated is, is, is the, the well but he operates this in this pump too but he operates these valves here manually okay the problem here well uh, the the contract was with in this case the contract was with our differentiation our seasonal differentiation Okay, so you see this, uh, and remember, this is manual operation. So the operator, he actually do this. That, that's the pump. You see, the beginning of the peak period, he turned off the pump, and then he, uh, after the end of the peak period, I'm going to zoom, okay, so you think it's better. So here is uh, an adequate operation. He turns off the pump at the beginning of the peak period, and then he turns on the pump. Something's trying to call us here. Okay, That's okay. In this, the, the following day, that's not the case, so he, he did turn off the pump, but he was, 
he was monitoring the water level, so he saw that, well, the level is below the minimum, so it's going to have water shortage, so he was obliged to turn on the pump. And by doing this, he's going to pay a fine, those increased tariffs that I was talking about. So you see, uh, sometimes things work properly because you have water in the reservoir, sometimes, as in here, no. Now here, he, he didn't bother to turn off because he saw the, the level was almost at the minimum, so he kept the pump working all the time. So the problem here was not related to, uh, to um, choosing a contract, with, a contract with our seasonal differentiates. It's a problem of operation because you see, he turns on the pump here. Let me zoom again, for instance. Uh, yeah, let me get this example here. He turns on the pump here to avoid shortage, but you see those are the levels in the other reservoirs. He still have water in the other reservoirs. Okay, why is he not uh, using water from the other reservoirs? Okay, I'm, I'm going to tell you why. Because he have to manually change these valves here. And, well, he simply ignores this. That's the problem. Okay? And this represented a very, uh, the cost of operation of this pump, since, since the power is very significant, uh, the cost was, was very high. What was our proposition? So that, that's my, my joke here. No? The elevated reservoir attains its minimum okay? uh, during peak periods. So the pump is activated to avoid shortage, despite the fact that there is water available in the other reservoir. So it's like this situation here. Things are uh, exploding, and well, I don't know what the operating is, is doing. Okay, so uh, you see, uh, in terms of in, to calculate the amount of uh, uh, time that you pass, that you have to activate the pump during the peak periods, that's a, uh, a pump activation. So hour hour of the day. Okay. And that's the probability of the pump being activated. So you see, within this purple region, you had a 7.8% here. And this multiplied by the, the fine gives you a lot of money, actually. So, yeah, you see. Uh, the difference, that's what, that was your question. The difference was 23%. Okay, so it's very, very, very significant with complaints of water so, so shortage because well if he for some reason forgets to to turn on uh, uh, this pump here for instance there's going to be a water shortage okay so the price was increased and there were frequent complaints of water shortage uh, what's what was the proposition proposition was automation I don't need to explain. Okay, so we, we changed a little bit configuration, but uh, the solution here was simply to, to replace the, the human operator by an automated operator. Actually, you still have a human operator here just to monitor the, the automation system. Okay, so uh, it's um, a higher skilled operator is not a guy just to turn on and off a pump, but uh, by doing this, and the cost for doing this was insignificant, actually, insignificant, because, well, the, the type of equipment that you need to do this is very cheap, okay? And that was, well, the, the softer configuration. But uh, I'm sure you, you don't need to, I don't need to elaborate on this because you understand the, the general idea. By doing this, the over cost went down to zero, so uh, nothing changed. Uh, uh, um, I mean, the cost, the over cost uh, was eliminated, the over cost associated with fines was eliminated, and also, uh, yeah, and also, I forgot to say something, and also 
uh, there were no more complaints of water shortage because the operation was uh, completely automated. Okay, so the cost went down in terms of reais. This is very significant. Okay, uh, for the consumer, it it became better because no more uh, shortages. Okay, and well, that's it. And the price, uh, yeah, and the investment was insignificant because all that was necessary was um, it's not even a computer. You only need to have a, a, a PLC with uh, with our cap with um, what we call a, a calendar clock. Okay, because you need to know. You need to know when your um, when the peak is going to start and when the peak period is going to end. Okay, and this today in in terms of reais, this should be this should cost something around I don't know five thousand reais or something like uh, I don't know five hundred dollars something like this. Okay, so that's it. Uh, just to conclude. Uh, well, I hope I managed to pass the, the general ideas related to, to energy planning and uh, with some emphasis on renewable energies. As Daniel Jürgen says, so those are strategies for the de development of energy system. And one point, this, uh, this observation here is related to actually to the conclusion of our course today. Okay, because as I mentioned, this is the last class. And, uh, well, I try to cover uh, very different subjects because, because these strategies related to energy planning and uh, rationalization and so on, in terms of knowledge, they involve uh, basic scientific knowledge, okay, hard sciences, we, call, we can call it like this, physics, mathematics, and so on. Uh, biology, chemistry, and so on, and also technology, which is related to engineering, okay, in addition to economic and social analysis techniques. So it's a very multidisciplinary subject, energy planning and energy strategies and so on. Okay, if you want to have a, an understanding um, a good understanding of this area, you have to somehow uh, have knowledge of these uh, multiple subjects. Okay, so the, the I, I think I coined this term. I'm, I'm not sure, but I call this energy erudition. Okay, energy erudition. Erudition, not in uh, in the Beethoven sense of the word erudition. Okay. Erudition in the sense that you have to somehow uh, know these things, these very varied things. So, so that's why I, was, I, I talked during this course about economics, about social aspects. That's what I covered today, talking about PLE, for instance. So you only get to, to do something properly in this area when you have energy erudition. And the whole point of this course is uh, try to give you this erudition. Uh, if not, if you don't consider yourselves with enough knowledge of this uh, so much varied areas, at least I gave you, uh, I will consider as successful the course if the classes uh, represent pointers to subjects. For instance, for, for those of you that are not uh, familiar with e economics and uh, those econometric parameters, for those of you that are not familiar with this, uh, you, can, you can use the class and the, the slides that are already available as an entry point to the subject. Okay, So that's my point. That's the, the whole objective of this course. We can put this in... Um, in, in graphs, the, the, in terms of areas involved. So, as I mentioned, economics, planning, regulation, politics, and, and so on, and science and technology. 
those are the areas and when I say erudition somehow I don't know how <laughs> probably working at Saturday night and so on somehow you have to cover these areas at the same time that's energy erudition and if uh, I manage to to increase your erudition in in this manner I may consider uh, a successful course for you or my task as a teacher so that's it uh, thank you very much I think uh, this ends our course okay I have a, a saying here that I want to, uh, to to read for you then no? the idea of this course if I could summarize this in, in a single statement the idea is to analyze and equate the problems associated with the transition of the energy grid because this is going to happen okay from a few non-renewable to a great number of renewable sources so we have to destroy something in order to create something new and uh, well you see uh, what has to be destroyed or replaced the word is not <laughs> very good here is the non-renewable sources okay so uh, in order to do this we have to have what I'm calling energy erudition in addition to be to be experts in our specific areas okay in addition to be experts in econ economics and biology and chemical engineering and so on we have to have some uh, amount of energy erudition and that's the idea of this course so that's it thank you very much for attending if you have questions thank you so much teacher thank you okay thank you. <laughs> okay so um, for the grades um, uh, yeah sorry I didn't hear you ah <laughs> thank you for attending <laughs> Thank you, thank you for not sleeping during the class. <laughs> okay. uh, whatever you can send through email, you can send through Facebook, or I'll, I'll find because it well, there's not so much. Okay. Through through Facebook. It's better because I have uh, I think this semester I'm teaching about I don't know 150 undergraduate students and uh, well they are sending me their their projects their final projects so I have a flood of emails with uh, attached files and so on and uh, through Facebook it's a lot more easy to to separate things okay Okay. So that's it. Thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs>